sorry, sorry, Goyal Hav. Welcome to Goyal Hav. Um, today with me, I'm so excited to have, um, this is Welsh Day, just in case anyone didn't, didn't notice, come right. Um, and um, unfortunately, uh, I do not speak fluent Welsh, so this video will not be in Welsh, um, but we will be talking about Welsh women's writing and the press hollow, who um, are really pioneers um, in both the independent press and in particular in Welsh women's writing. Um, so with me today I have Caroline o Caroline, <laughs> Caroline Oakley, who is the editor of Hollow Press and has also edited in her um, varied career some books you might have heard of such as Ian Rankin and numerous others. Um, with me, I also have Manon Stefan Ross, um, who is the author, who is an author of over 20 children's books and 20 plus and three plus adults books in Ungumraig again. Um, Manon is also a storyline plotter for S4C or S Pedwaek, um, as it is in Welsh. And um, she's worked on lots of Welsh soap operas currently, including Publicum and Round Around. Um, so thank you both for joining me today. I can't thank you enough for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Not at all. So why don't we start a little bit with what Hono is, um, Caroline, and what, how did it start? Um, because unlike many of the other presses I do talk to on here, um, you started in the 1980s, 1983, I believe. Uh, well, not me personally, but the, the girls who set the company up did. Um, it was basically set up because a number of women who, were, who had been at Abba Uni together um, were all keen literature fans, big readers, and had identified the fact that there was a distinct lack of Welsh women's writing being published within the small presses in Wales at the time, both in English and in Welsh. Um, and it was kind of the beginning of the second wave of feminism. They were aware of the rise of the women's press in Virago and wanted to set, set up an equivalent in Wales. And they began very, very small, literally round a kitchen table in Cardiff, I believe. Um, and they raised the money for their first two titles by doing a share issue. So approaching all their networks, all the women that they knew and asking them if they'd like to contribute and buy a share in their emerging cooperative and pay for the first two books. So that's how it began. Um, they then slowly expanded their publishing programme until they were in a position to apply to the Welsh Books Council, now the Books Council of Wales, for a, what's currently called a revenue grant. So that gives you money in advance towards your expenses for publishing. And I think in between the two, they were able to get funds from the Arts Council of Wales on an individual title by title basis. And so what does Hono do and what sort of the aim of Hono as a press as it currently exists now then? Um, as we currently exist, we still have very much the same ethos and the same mems and arts. Um, we, we're run as a cooperative. Um, we have a voluntary management committee who look after the publishing and the staff. We now have, I think, 1.3 full-time equivalent staff. So that we each have different responsibilities, but none of us are completely full time. Um, and we still publish both in Welsh and English, and we're currently expanding our contemporary Welsh output. Um, so we currently publish 10 new books in the English language per annum, plus one or two others if we get extra commission and grants, and one new Welsh title every two years and one classic Welsh language title every two years. That's a pretty, a pretty impressive outfit um, um, and you sort of published such a um, variety of books over the years. Are there any that sort of stand out to you? Um, I don't, on the list? I, don't know. I think the thing is we publish a very wide range because we still have an open sh submissions pile which a lot of places now don't do, or if they do, they're only open for two weeks, every, twice a year or something. Um, and although we don't publish many books per year, um, we like to have the broadest possible range to appeal to all the women in Wales. So we have a mix of fiction and non-fiction. We have a mix of literary fiction, very popular fiction, and kind of everything in between. Mm. So it makes the publishing very diverse, which, you know, there are some good things about that. There are some bad things about that. Um, 
do you want to at least state on what what are those what are the good things <laughs> what are the bad things well the good thing is you you have the widest possible market and the bad things are sometimes if you're more specialist people know to come to you for something very specific mm -hmm. so for instance seren's poetry list is very well known very well subscribed to and very successful because they very much specialize in one thing mm -hmm. so for those who don't know seren is a Welsh press but um, again another independent press based in Bridgend they are indeed and then do you want me to talk about new titles old titles things on the back list that I think people should look out for yes please absolutely I'd love to hear about them I don't know it's I mean this is my personal thing this is not a Hono thing um there are a couple of titles that stand out for me one older one and we have an author called Caroline Ross who's written two books, um, one set in World War II um, called The War Before Mine, which I think is, it did very well at the time and it's one of the few that we've reprinted within three or four months of publication. And then she wrote a second novel called Small Scale Tour, which is about a theatre company, a travelling theatre company based in the Northeast, which is very much based on her and her husband's mm real life in that he was a theatre director and they did work out of Newcastle um, but it has a, an episode of magic realism in the middle of it um, mm -hmm. and it moved me to tears and there aren't many books that do that especially when you work on them and you read them six times and tear them to shreds and put them back again so that's one I think people should take a look at if they have feeling brave enough um, and then of the more recent titles that we've published, I happen to have it handy just so that I can flash it on your screen. Stevie Davis, The Party Wall, which I think Stevie's well known. She's well respected. She writes literary fiction. But this book, I think, would appeal to a much wider audience. It's basically a kind of literary take on the stalker novel. And it's very blackly funny. And I laughed out loud parts of it much to the amusement of my colleagues in the office but it's a terrific read and because it came out literally a month before lockdown it's almost disappeared and that's a crying shame really mm -hmm. it's an excellent book and I really think people should take a look at it go and ask your indie bookseller if they can supply one to you I saw um a post on Twitter from um the Waterstones branch of Harrogate and they had a whole little stand of books that had come out during lockdown that you might have missed. Mm. Not featuring mine, but featuring lots from indie presses. Um, so I sent them a copy of it. So I'm really hoping that they'll put it on their little shelf and stock it because I thought that was a great idea. It's only a little small stand, mm. but, you know, I so feel for all those authors, big and small, from whatever size press, who've been published in the last 12 months. Because if you were published at the beginning of it, nowhere was open for people to browse and see it if they didn't already know about it. And if you were published in September, October, when everything opened up again, there were so many new titles all at the same time that it was so easy to get lost. Mm -hmm. So that's just two. And they're, they're my personal choices rather than this is, I think, the best things Hono's ever produced. We produce such a wide range of things. There's something for every taste. Fantastic. There once was a time where I may or may not have walked in a worked in a Waterstones cluster that included Harrogate, actually. <laughs> and so shout out to Waterstones. Small world. Small world. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Manon, how was it to have your book published um, by Hono? And in particular here, we're talking about the seasoning. Um, because is it my understanding that this is your only book with Hono and English language? Yeah. Um, so sort of, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about that before we move on to some quite interesting um, facts about this book and some of it's quite unusual, um, certainly within my experience of translators and the fact that you self-translated the book. I did. Yeah, well, it's just such an honour to, to have a title published with Hono because it's a press that I've admired from afar for several years. I think one of the books that I pick up most often from my bookshelf is, um, I think one of the first books, if not the first book that Anna printed, which was a, a reprint of the first collection of Welsh language poetry by a woman. Um, in Wales uh, by um, a poet called Ellen Eckrin and she happened to live um, 
quite close to where I live now and I, I pick that up all the time. So I was very aware, you know, of Honor as, as a press. Um, I, I, was, I wasn't sure that I wanted to translate my book. I wasn't sure if it was translatable. It's a really odd thing if you live in a culture where, you know, I speak, I was brought up through the medium of Welsh. It's my first language. I speak Welsh with my own kids. I do most of my work through the medium of Welsh. And I, it, it's hard in that situation to know if what you write creatively will work in another language because there's, there's no way of knowing. There's no way of knowing. And the, the seasoning or blasts, it was in Welsh, felt to me before translation um, a, a, that it was a novel that was so intrinsically Welsh that I didn't know if it would feel forced um, if, if it was translated and uh, read in the English language, but actually it was a, a process that I really enjoyed unexpectedly. So, you know, I, I really did. I hadn't written in English since school mm. and it was like, finding a new toy, you know, oh, can you use all these words as well? It was great. And, and just to explore the novel again um, in another language and to see how it feels differently um, in English. And what, what, how does it feel differently? Because I, I also feel like it, and clearly you've conveyed something in the English language version that also feels intrinsically Welsh. And it's, you know, it's centred on an incredibly you know, it's a, it's a Welsh community that's very mm. recognisable in lots of ways and um, to people who've grown up in Wales, even, you know, even though I'm from a very different part of Wales, that definitely doesn't have the same um, type of communities, but maybe some of the same people. <laughs> yeah, I think for me, the biggest difference is because I, I I'd never translated my own work before and I've gone on afterwards to translate uh, a few more books, but I, I was quite scared of the process and I translated it almost word for word to begin with. And then I went back and, and tried to smooth it and see and began to, you know, feel a bit more confident and feel that I was able to mess around with it a little bit more. Um, but the, the biggest shock for me was that in Welsh, it feels a lot darker. Um, and the people who have read it in Welsh and English they say the same, it just feels like a really dark, heavy novel in Welsh. And it's just that little bit lighter in English. I don't, I don't know what that is, but I wonder if it's to do with the um, literary landscape in, in Welsh, um, that somehow there are references in there or just nods in there to other novels that have, um, talked about similar sort of themes. I, I, I don't know what it is, but I wonder if it is something like that, just a kind of cultural knowledge of Welsh things. And of course, things have a different soul in every language. I do feel that it's a different, it feels like a different novel to me. You know, I think the resonances are different. And it is, it is the, it's the unwritten bits, it's the bit between the lines that if you don't know you won't recognize. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was interesting for me. And what, I mean, one of the reasons that I enjoyed working on it is um, like, te like Telen Egrin, like Erin Egrin, I lived in Flanagrin for five years. So it was a fun process between Manon and I. Uh, and I think one of the things we added was, I, I remember saying to you, we need more atmospherics because I know the village and I can see it and feel it, but I'm not sure that the English reader who doesn't know this part of Wales will do that. I remember you saying, because um, uh, I think about everyone who reads it in Welsh, m more or less everyone's going to know what the landscape of Wales generally is like, so they're going to be able to read into a little bit of what the landscape is like without my having to say it, but I remember Caroline saying, you know, what if someone from Australia it, they're not going to know anything and that really sort of blew my mind <laughs> and also just the, the cultural uh references I just thought oh yeah I think I, I write about cultural references without even thinking about it and without even th 
thinking that people might not know this thing or that story or you know that place Mm, absolutely one of the sort of unique things about this not unique but like things I really liked about this book is that it's a polyphonic book and it's much you know that's not simply in this case it's not three or four narrators basically Mm. most chapters are a different narrator and then you get a few sort of propping up um, a couple of times and um, what sort of made you write the book like that it's it's gorgeous it really unveils um in a very satisfying and lovely way oh thank you um I think the the character of Peggy the main character I just wanted to explore this idea that we're very different people um to different people so the version that my sons know of me is very different to the version that um, my workmates know of me and um, this patchwork creates a person that no one ever truly knows um, and I liked playing around with that idea that you can create your own character without revealing much of yourself at all. It, it made life very difficult <laughs> because I, I kind of started writing it that way without making the decision to write it that way and I kind of halfway through I thought God, I'm just confusing myself and I'm being tied up in knots but that's kind of how it came. Did you hear the voices in your head as different voices? But in Yeah well- I knew them all I'm always sort of character led I, ne- I, I kind of try and plot things before I write and I never stick to it I find it really boring if I know what, I'm, what happens at the end. Um, but I know the characters very, very well. And I remember with, with um, the seasoning, with Blasi, um, I went to Machenlef Market. Uh, they have a market every Wednesday, Machenlef, and there's this guy outside the Wednesday Arms, and he sells uh, old books and old photographs, um, and he has a box uh, that says People 25p. And they're all old photographs of people, um, no names, just, you know, hundreds of these photographs. So I w- I'd started thinking about the idea of this novel and I was looking through these photographs and I found a photo and that was Peggy. Yeah. And I found a photo and that was Francis. And I think I, I bought three or maybe four photographs from, from that man and decided that they were my characters. And I kept them, I've never shown them to anyone, but I know them. And I've done that with books afterwards as well. I find that really helpful. Oh, oh, I think you gave me chills. That's so lovely. That's so lovely. The other sort of, um, one of the other really noticeable things about the book as well is um, that you have a recipe at the front of each chapter and the recipe sort of comes up or the meal will come up. And, it, you know, it's really, it is a book about um, food and disordered eating and the way in which these, you know, come from our childhoods mm-hmm. and um, carry, you know, and without sort of proper therapy and that sort of thing. Um, but um, food is really central, recipes are really central. The only other book I'd come across this in, I think, is um, like Water for Hot Chocolate um, oh, yeah. by Laura Esquivel. Um, and I just loved it in both. <laughs> Yeah, I wondered like, what motivated you to include the recipes. I am obsessed with food. Um, and I think, I remember a, a period when I looked back at my own circle of friends. I'm 38 now. And I look back at my circle of friends and I realised that most of us um, had a complex relationship with food. When I wrote Blasi, the, the Welsh original of, of the seasoning, I was in denial about my own relationship with food. Um, just, you know, feeling that some foods are bad and some foods are good and that thinness is what we need and want. And just that using it as... as um, reward and punishment and I think I I almost needed to write the novel in order to sort of explore uh, my own relationship with food if I'm completely honest. I think it's so central um, to everything really I you know I get up in the morning and I'm I know what I'm going to eat that 
at the complete, you know, all all the time, and I'm always either losing weight or putting weight on. I'm never sort of just there. Um, but also just the joy of it, the the fact that when you can't do anything to help someone, you can cook for them. Mm. When my mother died, I remember she died young and people would come round um, and they'd bring food. And I remember me and my sister being really confused. Why, why is there hundreds of Welsh cakes in the house? Um, and I think it was just helplessness. They can't do anything except this one thing. And I do that. It's my, it's, it's the most effective and true and authentic way I know of showing love is to cook food for someone, to feed them. It's so complicated. It's, it should be so simple, but it just isn't. Um, well, it was, it's interesting that you say that because that's definitely why the disordered eating in the book resonates to me because I also feel the same. You know, out of my group of friends, everybody has a, and sort of fat phobia and everything like that is so internalized in our culture. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know shame around food is in belt anyway if people would like resources on this there will be some of my favorites linked below um, in particular a podcast called she's all fat and and um, mm -hmm. london center for intuitive eating laura thompson highly recommend um yeah i really i don't think there are your portrayal felt thoughtful honest and respectful in a way that disordered eating is rarely portrayed in literature you know you have certain stereotypes about certain um, disordered eating um, patterns and that get portrayed and maybe glamorized, we might want to say, in certain ways. And rarely does it feel um, quite so beautifully real as that. Oh, thank you. I think if I would have gone out, to, if I would have decided that I was going to write a novel about um, disordered eating or, or complicated relationships people have with food, it wouldn't have been the same novel. But I think just because it's so, it feels so normal to have an abnormal relationship with food, it just felt natural. It felt like that was, that was who she was. That was who that character was. Um, and so because there was no effort really put into that kind of portrayal, I wasn't careful. I didn't feel like I was being careful in my portrayal of the, of the the complexity of, of relationships with food um I think maybe that's why it works mm. Mm. Well, yeah, I don't think I've ever had a particularly complex relationship with food because when I was young I was lucky I was just naturally slim most of the time mm. but what I often do is I love to cook and that's kind of a stress reliever and an escape for me so it's kind of the almost the flip side of it and that that urge to cook for other people particularly because I've spent most of my adult life living alone is I spent you know when we were allowed to I used to spend a lot of time having people around to dinner because that's my as you say it's my way of caring for them but I it's also a stress reliever and an escape for me is because when you're when you're cooking or when you're baking you're in the moment and you don't you know I don't necessarily then think about other things while I'm doing it it's, it's a physical act isn't it to cook or especially to bake baking bread I think that need that process of kneading is, is so tactile mm. um it's it's a hug really but without being able to actually hug <laughs> or without without knowing how to do that physically sometimes but you don't quite know how to do that with that person but yeah that's it's definitely a gesture of love into bread baking during lockdown because they weren't getting enough hugs and they needed it. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I think having sourdough is like having either a small baby or a small animal because every two hours you have to go and check on it and give it another pummeling and then come away again. I'd only ever done all, you know yeast bread before lockdown, but so I I joined the sourdough train. But yeah, it takes a bit more looking after. 
it was okay. far more I did the same and it was far more work than either of my children or both put together so I gave <laughs> up straight away oh, um, Caroline I was wondering so um I hope I hope you don't I, I think that um I think this comparison is a useful one. I don't mean to make this comparison um, because you are two Welsh female writers that I know, <laughs> um, but I saw a lot in seasoning um, that paralleled with um, Carol Lewis's Martha Jakashanko. Mm -hmm. um, and it was, it was the setting, but more than the setting, it was actually the focus on a older character. And um, again, that felt like something slightly, not new, unique here, something that we don't see in the vast majority of literature um, is you don't see somebody who is older towards the end of their life. Um, and that was something I raised with Carol and I was like, oh, and it's here as well. I was wondering if that's something, um, Caroline, that you sort of, is it one of the things that is sort of unique in, not unique in Welsh literature, but coming up in conversation? And then Manon as well, um, what you sort of think about that question of age? Um, I don't know that it's unique to Welsh literature. I think possibly some Welsh women writers got there sooner than English language writers. Mm -hmm. um, at the moment, there is a bit of a trend in corporate UK publishing towards older narrative. I've just read a book called Saving Missy, mm. which I found at my sister's when I was there for a visit and brought home with me to read. Because I often, I often, it's funny, people always say you must read lots. It's like, yeah, I read lots of things that no one else ever sees because they never get published. I don't actually read that many published books unless I'm on my holidays. Um, anyway, so I, and that basically the lead character in that is a woman in her late 70s maybe even over eight just about 80 and it's about her her husband is gone i won't give away the twist but he's not there um and she's in a big house all on her own and quite lonely and the only time she sees people is in a park and she makes friends with a couple of much younger women one of whom dumps a dog on her and the dog takes her out of her house and out of her normal routine and it, I think the way that the author described, and I'm not going to be able to remember her name now, but the book is definitely called Saving Missy, her relation, how she builds a relationship with these younger women and the affect they each have on the other is really interesting. And, and then I think of what, maybe five, six years ago, there was also an older writer who was first published in the UK who was writing about somebody in their 60s that garnered a lot of attention because it was seen to be unusual. But I think, yes, very possibly, certainly in literary fiction, I mean, I'm talking about slightly more commercial fiction, that Wales led the way. I agree. I agree. Yeah, I think um, Caril's work has definitely influenced mine, but it's really, it, I think it, I've only just come to realise that there's a huge difference between what the trends and the um, influences are in the English language publishing scene. The, the, there's a completely separate Welsh publishing scene that people don't really know about. And, and of course, because our, our influences are different, we're gonna be writing about different things. I, I'm quite used to reading about strong older women, I think. Um, in Welsh language literary fiction um, and yeah it, it, it's it's just such a, a weird moment when you come to realize that oh yeah it's, it's, these are completely separate and different literary scenes um, in the Welsh language I was speak, talking about this recently in the Welsh language if if you are a reader of books in Welsh, you tend to be, because there's not, not that many books published, you tend to read almost everything that's published in the Welsh language. So if I'm reading something in English, I will read the types of books that I know that I'm gonna enjoy. So I'll read maybe sort of family saga type books, and then I'll read some sort of philosophy books and something like, things like that. But in Welsh, I will more or less read 
most of what's published um, fiction novels. Mm -hmm. And I think that makes, that, that changes our literature because we, we, you know, I will read sort of crime and I will read, you know, if there's a vampire book, I'll read a vampire book. It, it, it influences what you, what you write and what is produced. Um, it's quite freeing. I think you, you're not put in a box. You're not this type of writer. You're just a writer. So do you think do you think that Welsh language writers are more likely to write cross genre than English language ones? Definitely, definitely. I feel um, very free as a Welsh language author, and it's not that I don't feel free um, as an English language author, um, but I think no one has ever or I'm not aware that anyone's ever sort of said that I'm this a particular type yeah. of author. Um, you know, I, I write books for young children with like five words in the books and then I, I'll write 80,000 word novels as well. And no one's ever really questioned this, it's just the way it's done. Yes, it's interesting because very often people who do that in the English language within the English mainstream trade are coerced into using a different name mm. so if you write it you know you can be Ian M Banks for science fiction and fantasy and you can be Ian Banks for your literary novels but you can't be Ian Banks for both just to use one obvious example mm. Mm. Um, there's such a it's really interesting that you read everything or oh basically everything i'm uh, generalizing that you know yeah, but, no, you know. <laughs> yeah like completely never told you to that either like did you read this <laughs> <laughs> um, um, but i don't know something i don't know if it's because um when your language is a minority language and when your communities are more likely to be threatened that you sort of solidify that sense of community you're interested in community you write about community um but there's such a strong sense of community like the, the polyphonic nature of this book is sort of reinforcing that message you know we're hearing about a community story from everyone in a community and I was wondering how like community influences your writing man on and then sort of your publishing um Caroline and li Welsh literature in general I just write whatever story is in my head to write at that time it actually is that simple and I I feel quite strongly that the language in which you choose to write doesn't have to be a political statement and I think sometimes people feel like it is, um, people feel like if you're writing or reading in Welsh it's because you're um, trying to prop up um, or support uh, uh, your culture and it's not, it's just, it's just the language that I live my life that, and that moves that simple and I'm really lucky because I get to I, I have two languages and I get to write in both those languages and it's great it's not a political declaration of anything it's just comes naturally and I think when it gets to that point that's a sign of a, a healthy culture yeah yeah I think that's having come to Wales from outside that's one one of the things I appreciate about it you know, I lived in London for 20 years, which was an incredibly diverse culture, particularly if you live in Tooting, like I did. You know, there are all sorts of people from all sorts of places speaking all sorts of languages. And I think the fact that Wales does still hold to its own language makes it inherently more diverse, especially considering that now there are more and more incomers who are moving to the countryside and they come in waves. I've found it really interesting over the time that I've been here, lots of my friends have had kids and many of them, even though they speak no Welsh at all, opt to have their children go through Welsh medium teaching and to be in a Welsh stream at school. Um, and through their children learning, they themselves learn, some of them become more or less fluent, but it does make you part of a community. I mean, Manon knows Mach really well, and that's where I spend a lot of my time when I arrived as well. And that for a long time, I think there were two separate communities, particularly after CAT first came, which is how I got there. There were the English speakers 
who had come in from outside and who were green and sustainable and hippies and known as the shit and wind. And then there was the rest of Mac who were had been there for generations, were farmers or had been in a market town for a long time. But the more generations of kids that go through the school and that become bilingual, it's made a much more coherent community within Mac. So that and, and which I can see the difference even in the relatively short time that I've been here. And I think that's a good thing. I think it adds to both cultures rather than taking away from it. I mean, I have three godchildren, two of them from one family whose father is first language Polish, their mother is English, and they went to Welsh language school. So they went through Flanken Velin, which was Welsh medium through, and they now go to Welsh stream at their senior school. Then my other goddaughter, her father is Greek Cypriot and his mother tongue was Greek. And she now speaks Welsh, Greek and English. So, you know, to, diff to varying degrees of proficiency, but she went to a school where she didn't start learning Welsh until she was seven. So, um, but by the end of it, they meld so that they now are all pretty much on a level. I wouldn't say they were 100% bilingual in the way that Manon is, but they're as near as damn it. Is there um, sort of staying on the theme of language? Um, have you ever written as a, have you, you translated this obviously, but do you write in English um, at all as well? And if so, like, what do you find um, that is fabulous about Welsh and that like gives you the language in Welsh? And then maybe also if you want to talk about English, but that's fine, enough people talk about English. <laughs> we're, we're, we're here to celebrate Welsh. Uh, I think just the fact that I have both um, makes me appreciate um, the beauty of both in really different ways. I think I'm a really different writer. I think I, my voice is different in Welsh and English. Um, I've translated quite a lot of my own work now, but I do have kind of half uh, an English language novel that I'm sure that I've told Caroline about yeah. 10 years ago. Yeah. Not, not 10 years ago, I'm but sure five years ago. <laughs> I and I've just email. left it. Um, I just thought, oh, I'm not sure if I like this. And I just left it and not gone back to it at all. Um, but there are certain idioms in Welsh that when you come to translate something, it's literally you come across this idiom and you think, okay, how do I say that in English? And one of them, when I was doing um, the seasoning, I remember realizing for the first time how beautiful this idiom we have in Welsh, which is when it starts um, snowing, just when it, it's just starting to snow, the literal translation of the Welsh would be that it's, it's feathering. Mm. And I realized, I thought, oh, that's so lovely. And I, I don't hear it anymore because it's my first language and it's always been there. And just in the process of translation, you know, I would come across these these terms, these idioms, these sayings and think, oh, they're so lovely. But equally, you know, in English, sometimes I'd write a sentence and, and think, oh, I, I just get so much joy from language and being able to use these words. I've translated other people's work as well, um, creative work, and I think that's so different and so, so much more difficult because if it's my work, I get to mess around with it how, how, however I want to. And also it's it's my voice. But if I'm translating Enid Blyton, it's very important that you don't hear Manon Stefan Ross's voice and that you hear Enid Blyton's voice. So that's a completely different kettle of fish again. When you translate into Welsh, um, are you doing mostly children's books? Are you doing like a wide variety? I'm so interested in that process. Uh, yeah, I've just I've just done children's books um, so far. Uh, but yeah, I'd quite like to get my teeth into something a bit bigger, I think a bit more sizable. But at the moment, I, I think I'd quite, I'm, I'm warming to the idea of writing something original in English, just because it's not something I've I've ever published before, and yeah, I just like to have a go. 
<laughs> maybe you just have to wait for the right idea to come along and there will be something that speaks to you in English rather than in Welsh and then yeah. it'll be really easier yeah I think you've just got to you've just got to be patient and, and as you say wait for the right thing but I I'd like to find that half novel just to see what what I wanted to do mm. when I was writing it what was on my mind and what yeah what I was trying to do with it <laughs> um if um thank you both this has been so interesting um i think there's quite a few quotes i feel that already can like be pulled out of this talk <laughs> um, um i wondered if we could wrap up um with sort of um so caroline's already mentioned a few recommendations i wonder if anyone had any others um of welsh women's writing that um you think should be read more and heard more widely um, in either Welsh or English. Um, oh, that's a hard one. Yeah, sorry, I've done there's so many there. of them. <laughs> um, Put you on the spot. In the Welsh language, um, there's a new novel that's come out by a, a, an emerging writer called Megan and Harad Hunter. And it's her first novel. And it's about um, a a two teenagers uh, who meet in hospital. Um, and it's just groundbreaking. It's one of those novel that you just, I had to put it down sometimes because it was just too much. It was just, it's just so powerful and her voice is just so new and fresh and it's unlike anything in any language. But also I really love the novels that Homer have published um, by the author Crystal Jeans. I've just loved them so much and they're so shocking. Um, it's one of the things, it, it's so different as well to the type of thing that I write. It's, it's one of those things where you realise Honor just does so much, you know, it's, it's just such a, a wide array of styles and things that are available. And the, the novels by Crystal Jeans are just, oh, mind bending um, that it's probably that's probably one of my proudest moments at hono in a way is that we had the guts to do it because some they are quite outre in several ways and she would probably have never been found otherwise and now she's graduated to a mainstream london press so and i think without small indie welsh companies like hono and parthian and seren and all the rest doing what they do those voices might never get to be heard. And I think that would be terribly sad. I mean, one of the things I wish is that there were a specific grant for translating Welsh language fic novels and other works, but particularly novels into the English language, because I think a lot of them are really, really worthy of a much, much wider readership. And English is what they call a, it's, it's, it's a language, uh, there's a word for it and I've forgotten the word now, but it's, it's kind the of- The word in Welsh, we, uh, just it's to bring it back to the, the, the bridge language. The bridge language. So if people can read an English translation of the Welsh work, they are more likely to translate it into Dutch, Chinese, Swahili, whatever, mm -hmm. because that bridge exists. Mm -hmm. Whereas finding someone who could translate from Welsh to Dutch or Dutch to Welsh is going to be 10 times more difficult. So that's why Hono has tried to publish more Welsh women's writing in English, which was originally written in Welsh, but it's very hard for a small indie with limited resources to do. Um, it works if the author is willing to do it themselves financially, but to pay a third party translator is much, much more expensive generally. I mean, nobody wants to shortchange them for the work that they do, and it's difficult work to do, but it does make getting those voices out there a little bit more difficult. I'm quite surprised though that grant doesn't exist. That feels like a grant we really ought to have. There's a small organisation called the Wales Literary Exchange who do uh. basically go out there and sell Welsh work to the wider world but they have a very limited pot of money. And generally speaking, they concentrate on quite literary fiction. Mm. And also there's an, an understanding within wider publishing that if you, 
get if if you sell your work to be translated that the company you sell it to will not exactly want a quid pro quo but that you'd be open to looking at translating their works into welsh or english and because hono has the guidelines that we only publish women who were born in wales or are currently resident in wales we can't offer that opportunity to those publishers so again that makes it a little bit more difficult i have to say the, the welsh literature exchange has made such a difference to me because i'm inherently lazy mm. and even you know that i like the idea of having my work translated um they their work managed to get me to the attention of an agent um who's kind of managed to sell one of my books in several different languages and I really wouldn't have gone after any of that myself and one of the, one of the shocking things to me in that whole process is that I, I've always kind of felt that um, the wider UK audience isn't really interested in Welsh translations but then what that process has proved to me is that the wider world is very interested <laughs> I found it far easier to get a publisher in the US than I did for my English work in um, in the UK. That is very interesting. That's funny enough. I feel like that tracks in um, in like my personal life. I feel like um, you know, so if I moved away for university and nobody's nobody's particularly interested in Wales and nobody has very much knowledge of Wales uh, that is quite shocking <laughs> like, well, sort that's, of, that's you know. why that's what amazes me is we have we had another author who wrote three novels um she got an agent off the back of those novels who has sold them and she went to them with a novel initially set in Wales and they made a move it to Cornwall and it's like, how are people ever going to know if they like Wales or Welsh writing if that still happens? I mean, I find that gobsmacking. I find that gobsmacking. I probably shouldn't even have said it. it's probably highly secret, but you might have to cut that bit out. But I'm, I mean, just for us, I think I think that's interesting. It's like, no, of course, no one's going to know. If, you know, maybe that's one of the good things the pandemic will do is, you know, the rest of the UK will come to Wales, realise what a bountiful country it is in terms of its culture and its countryside and they will want to read more about it mm. and there will be a bigger market for all of us in our words then mm. i can bleep the name out just let me know if i need to or not after after we <laughs> um, and it is true that as well like the us has um you know has a uh, somewhat uh, problematic um but nonetheless very um fertile infatuation with um sort of countries that they perceive as their heritage or where um sort of they're rooted in and speaking as somebody who is like an american citizen like you know this is my family i'm talking about as well can be um incredibly <laughs> um interested in sort of um idealizing i think this is something we've come back to as a festival a few times actually um that um people tend to idealize other cultures in these very like interesting ways um you know it's sort of often tallies with being separated from a culture and um, that that's when you start to idealize it um or sort of not actually truly being in it or in the community but sort of re maybe remembering um some lovely times and i think that's has an interesting layer on everything yeah, it's maybe about finding identity and wanting to feel that you belong. I don't know. Uh, but it's it's really interesting that just further afield, yeah. people are a lot more interested. And that was completely unexpected to me that, you know, people in Spain are really more interested than people in the UK. But maybe maybe that's that's not true of real people or real readers. Maybe it's just a, a trend within the publishing community or a thought within the publishing community and that it will all yeah. change. Yeah, if it doesn't have a track record, it, they're not interested. <laughs> That's no. the, and it can be quite a closing down thing. But again, the trade is changing massively. And the, in, even in the last two years, that need for inclusivity and diverse voices, I think, will open up a lot of opportunities. Mm. Mm. That's good to hear. That's really good to hear. 
Um, well, thank you both so much. I really enjoyed today um, and you've both contributed and I can't thank you enough for taking the time um, out of your weeks, especially Caroline, who's on holiday. Oh, <laughs> um, hello, bless you. <laughs> in the evening it's fine <laughs> I couldn't, I'm actually the painting the front door is on the list but it's been threatening to chuck it down all day so there's been no door painting going on so it's fine <laughs> hopefully it should be a bit better weather from tomorrow I think no, it's actually been fine but I was never I never quite dared get out there with the brush <laughs> Um, well, Dioch and Vaur, and um, see you both soon. And thank you, everybody, for watching. Um, if you want to see more of our talks and more of our Welsh Day in particular, um, you can see it all linked down below. Um, so we also have that conversation I mentioned with Carol Lewis and Gwen Davies. And we also have um, a few, maybe, I don't quite know at the point of recording, but we'll insert on the screen right here. <laughs> whether they definitely confirmed or not and whether that got recorded um so um thank you very much um for both of you for joining me and um see you all soon bye yeah.